Chico Noguchi, the first human predator with unimpeachable courage and honor, explored. The common understanding of predators is that they are beasts who live to hunt and hunt to live. But only true fans of the franchise know that these master hunters live by a robust code of honor, glory, and justice. To become a worthy predator, or Yaucha, as they are known in their own world, it takes a great deal of dedication, perseverance, and of course, strength. And to become a blooded Yaucha, it takes more than that. A Yaucha becomes an adult and worthy of taking up the title only after they have slain a Xenomorph and marked their head with its acidic blood. The Yauchas honor the title more than the title honors them. Naturally, it is challenging to get the blooded status and even more difficult for a human to get that status. Nonetheless, once upon a time, there lived a woman named Machiko Noguchi, who was bestowed with the blooded status by a predator leader named Broken Tusk. It was the sheer display of traits like courage that got her the status, but Rome wasn't built in a day, and similarly, Noguchi's journey was full of hardships and troubles. Her father committed suicide after being charged with embezzlement when she was young, and after that, she dedicated her entire life to bring back the glory that her family name had lost. And trust us when we say that she got a lot more than what she had hoped for. Machiko not only survived a xenomorph infestation, but went on to live alongside predators, often proving to be better than them in combat tactics and intelligence. By the end of this video, Many of you would become fans of her valor and her thrilling story. Just a heads up, we divided this video into three entries to explore the three major comics she appeared in, which are Aliens vs. Predator, Aliens vs. Predator War, and Aliens vs. Predator 3 World War. So, without further ado, let's explore this amazing character whose name itself is an amalgamation of the Japanese terms for true, thousand, and child, meaning she is one of her kind among a thousand children. Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. From a broken girl to the breaker of bones, Machiko Noguchi's life was eventful right from the beginning. Even as a child, while other kids enjoyed a carefree life, she was burdened with concepts like family, honor, and was charged with the responsibility of winning it back. When Machiko was little, her father, Akira Noguchi, was publicly humiliated and fired from his workplace on charges of misappropriation of funds that were placed in his trust. The incident filled Akira with grief, regret, and embarrassment and he ultimately committed suicide. When young Machiko found her father's body, shock and horror engulfed her, changing her demeanor forever, making her a cold and reclusive person. Although Machiko Noguchi had a normal upbringing, her father's acts had brought the Noguchi family a bad name. Machiko's mother, Keko Noguchi, married another man so that she would have nothing to do with the Noguchi surname. This further affected Machiko, and she became distant and withdrawn from her mother, so much so that they would hardly ever speak to each other. But the little girl, had successfully managed to transform her grief into her shield and a source of power and determination. Determination to bring back the lost family honor, determination to succeed in life and redeem herself. Miss Noguchi later joined the respectable Chigusa Corporation and used her intellect and hard work to rise higher and higher up the corporate ladder. As a corporate woman, she saw exponential success and soon secured for herself the position of administrator in the ranching colony on the planet of Ryushi. She reached Ryushi to replace the former administrator, Hiroki Shimura. But unlike Shimura, who was a people's person, Machiko didn't initially involve herself with the work that her subordinates did. Naturally, the ranchers saw her as an outsider who only pushed corporate papers and thought about making money for the Chigusa Corporation, instead of thinking about them. Even the staff at the various facilities of the small colony of Prosperity Wells tended to report to Shimura, despite the fact that Machiko had taken charge. So it's not hard to imagine that no one liked her, and one cannot really blame Machiko for this display of cold behavior, because the poor girl had never seen friends for the better part of her life. She had dedicated herself to success, and didn't ever stop to learn social norms, etc. Nevertheless, it was Shimura who helped her with this trouble. He explained to her that it was essential to adapt herself to the job and her people instead of adapting the job to herself. Being a smart woman, she paid heed to Shimura's counsel. We already told you that Ryushi was a ranching colony, but what exactly did they breed? Well, the Ranchers Association had signed a contract with the Chagusa Corporation to breed the indigenous animals called Renth. These were rhinoceros-like creatures with two horns 
and rent meat had proven to become a delicacy on earth. When the contract was signed three years ago, the ranchers didn't know that the prices of rent meat would soar, and now they demanded more payment for their sweat and blood. This was an opportunity for Machiko to win the favor of her people. As the contract had come to its end, Chagusa Corporation had sent their commercial freighter named Lecter to Ryushi to collect the shipment and bring it to Earth. Shimura had organized a welcome party for Lecter's Captain Tom Strandberg and co-pilot Scott Canover. Machiko announced that she had spoken to the executives at Chagusa and they had agreed to raise the money to be paid to the ranchers. Everything seemed fine, and Machiko was happy that she was walking in the right direction, but it was all going to be short-lived. The day after the welcome party, the colony's doctor, Dr. Kesser Revna, is approached by one of the ranchers named James Roth. She had found the carcass of an extraterrestrial specimen near the Beriki Canyon, very close to where the rents were kept and bred. What Roth had found was a dead face hugger. Clearly, the face hugger had impregnated a rent. Later, Roth went to Ackland, the head of ranchers, and told them how the rent were bumping into each other as if they were half asleep. Ackland assumed that the rent had some kind of an infection, and this could jeopardize the transport of his shipment because the Chagusa Corporation would want the animals quarantined and, naturally, Ackland's payment would get stalled. He instructed Roth to take the specimen to Kesser and tell him that she found it near Iwa Gorge, a spot some 30 kilometers away from where the rent herds were kept. Kesser analyzed the extraterrestrial specimen and figured that its body was carbon and silicon based and served as a vehicle to transport sperm or eggs. He had sent the report back to Earth and excited by its discovery, he left for Iwa Gorge on hover bike. He did find more alien creatures, but they were not what he was expecting. He was welcomed by a hunting party of Yauches who ambushed him. In fact, it was the space-faring Yachuas who had seeded the planet with xenomorph eggs so that younger, unblood Yachuas could take part in their coming-of-age ritual by slaying Xenos and marking their heads with the acidic Xeno blood. In an attempt to flee the extremely hostile and murderous Yauchas, Dr. Kesser hopped on his hoverbike, but he couldn't go very far. The hoverbike knocked down the Yaucha elder named Broken Tusk, or Dachande, and later rammed into the Predator mothership. The collision caused the mothership to explode and killed Dr. Kesser. Meanwhile, when Lecter's pilots, Tom Strandberg and Scott Canover, went inside their ship after the party, they got ambushed by several xenomorphs who had been born from the infected rent that were loaded on the ship. The xenomorphs killed the 13 crew members of the ship and cocooned Tom and Scott for later impregnation. It turns out that one of the eggs that Dachande and his Yauchas had dropped was a royal ovomorph, and it led to the birth of a xenomorph queen that took refuge in Lecter and made it her hive. When Machiko learned through Shamira that Dr. Kesser was missing, she went to his wife Miriam, who told her about Kesser's discovery and that Roth had come to him. Machiko soon deduced that it was Ackland behind Dr. Kesser's disappearance and confronted him. Ackland immediately conceded to his lie, but the man had the audacity to justify it by saying that he did it for the good of the ranchers. Shimura had sent a search and rescue team to Ira Gorge to look for Dr. Kesser, but instead they found something unbelievable and shocking. The predator leader, Broken Tusk, was still lying there, unconscious but breathing. They immediately boarded him in the chopper and took the giant beast to Dr. Miriam. It was the discovery of a century. Machiko and Shimura were called to the med center. As they beheld the creature, they heard a certain commotion outside. It was a young boy named Bobby Sheldon, whose hover bike had crashed just outside. Bobby had faced a near-death experience at the hands of predators who had killed his parents. Interestingly enough, predators do not kill unarmed prey because they believe in a code of honor. But the Chande's predators were willing to slay anyone and everyone, probably because they had lost their honor and were filled with rage owing to the capture of their leader. Nevertheless, Bobby was brought into the med center for first aid. When he saw Broken Tusk, he revealed, horror-stricken, that it was one of the creatures that killed his parents. Machiko knew right then and there that an attack was imminent. However, she was still in doubt about the nature of the attack and the intention of the predators. Were they in Prosperity Wells to hunt? Were they here to take over the desert planet? Shimura revealed that Broken Tusk's belt was made up of rent hide, and clearly, this wasn't their first visit to Ryushi. Meanwhile, the ranchers and the company staff started to prepare a line of defense to shield themselves from the impending Yaucho attack. Although Prosperity Wells was never intended to have a police force, 
the people joined hands against the common enemy. To make matters worse, there was something sinister lurking in the dark corners of Prosperity Wells, the Xenomorphs. When Machiko learned that Lecter pilots Tom and Scott were missing, she decided to investigate with Riley and Mason. Upon reaching Lecter, she got surrounded by several Xenomorphs, but to her fortune, an unblooded Yaucha appeared from nowhere and took on the Xenomorphs single-handedly. She now figured that the Yauchas were actually after the Xenomorphs and not the humans, and that the presence of humans on Ryushi served as a hindrance to the hunt. The unblooded who attacked the Xenos and unwittingly saved Michiko was called Gekyen. After Duchande's capture at the hands of humans, Tashinde sent Gikyen to scout Prosperity Wells. Although he didn't have much of a role in the comics, he died a pointless yet honorable death. Speaking of Tashinde, he nominated himself to be the acting clan leader and led the others to wreak havoc on the humans of Prosperity Wells. Through her life's experiences, Machiko had learned that it was never safe to side with the losing side. Therefore, she fled from the scene, noticing that Gikyen was losing. However, Tashinde and his clanmates killed Shimura in his security detail. While Machiko was mourning the loss of Shimura, her only friend on Ryushi, Machiko's junior, Weaver, called her to witness something grim and agitating. The predators were parading the heads of their recent victims and celebrating in a victory bonfire. Machiko had had enough by now. She was not going to allow others to control what happened to her and her people. So, she took the fastest hover bike on the planet, armed herself with a gun and 10 clips of ammo, and left to deal with the predators herself. But before that, she had to take care of Miriam, who was still at the med center with Broken Tusk. After meeting with Miriam, she handed her a semi-automatic gun and told her to shoot anything that wasn't human. Machiko then left for the holding pen of the rents, that had 3,000 of them, or shall we say 3,000 beasts, agitated and angry because of being stuffed in small spaces and under the heat of two suns for more than 33 hours. Well, 33 hours is one Ryushi day. She planned to unleash all of them so that they'd crush any Xeno or Predator that came their way. Soon, she heard a commotion coming from the med center and quickly turned her bike around. Tashinde had arrived at the med center to kill Miriam. Surprisingly, Miriam had released Broken Tusk from his restraints and he killed Tashinde for his disobedience an uncalled carnage of innocent humans on Ryushi. He got especially enraged on seeing the skull of a human child that Tashinde had kept as a trophy. As the two of them fought, Machiko returned and crashed her hover bike into the facility. She rescued Miriam and left the scene on a copter. By now, the unleashed rents had reached the spot and their stampede crushed several Xenos and Predators just as Machiko had anticipated. Broken Tusk, however, managed to find shelter on a tower, but a Xenomorph was after him. He would have died by falling down or by getting killed by the Xenomorph itself, but Miriam convinced Machiko to save him. She ensured Broken Tusk to jump and hold onto the craft, but a Xenomorph lunged on it and caused it to crash. Meanwhile, Tom and Scott, who the Xenomorphs had cocooned on Lecter, managed to flee the place. The two of them pulled Machiko out of the burning copter and brought her out of harm's way. But Machiko couldn't find Miriam anywhere. It wasn't before long that her fear had turned into reality as Broken Tusk brought a dead Miriam out of the rubble. To her disbelief, Broken Tusk wasn't like the other predators. He seemed to be taking responsibility for the things that had happened on Ryushi, for the unnecessary trouble that Prosperity Wells had to face because of his own mistake, and now he wanted to dedicate himself to take care of the situation. The four of them joined forces and made their way ahead to the colony's east lock to wait for safety. Upon arrival, they learned that the colonists had left the place. Machiko also came across a reply from Chagusa Corporation about how they wanted the extraterrestrial specimen alive and in good condition. Machiko's earlier request for colonial marines had been denied as well. So, the Chagusa was no less evil than corporations like Wayland Utini. Shortly, Tom started to convulse violently and a chest burster came out of him, which Broken Tusk wasted no time to kill. Scott also realized that he had been impregnated and Machiko offered to euthanize him. He agreed to it, but not before giving Machiko the codes to Lecter's orbital barge that would help her crash it on the Prosperity Wells complex, an act that would destroy the hive. But the trouble was far from over as another unblooded Yacha attacked them and Machiko was quick enough to gun him down. This impressed Broken Tusk so much that he named her Doubt to a D, 
or a small knife in his language. In the end, Machiko and Broken Tusk headed to the Lecter to end the menace once and for all. However, they hadn't yet faced the Queen, and when they did, she proved to be more formidable than any other xenomorph they had encountered. She mortally wounded the Yaocha leader, but the combined strength of Machiko and Broken Tusk enabled them to decapitate the Queen. Now that Prosperity Wells was ridden of the twin problem of aliens and predators, Broken Tusk marked Machiko's head and xenomorph blood with his insignia, meaning that she had been accepted in the clan as a predator. All the colonists had been moved to more friendly locations by the Chigusa Corporation, but Machiko decided to stay back on Ryushi in the hope that Broken Tusk's clan would someday return to the planet and she'd once again be able to hunt again. Hunting versus humanity. What's her hard-hitting high quality? It wasn't before long that Machiko's wish was fulfilled and she got to meet other predators who had come to Ryushi. She had been waiting to join them and in an attempt to do so, she saved the life of one of the predators. Their leader, whom Machiko called Top Knot, examined her and noticed the mark that Dachande had given to Machiko. After it became clear that it was a dying gift from Dachande to her, Top Knot accepted her into the clan. In due course of time, Machiko proved to be a skilled warrior, but the Yaucha community went by simpler codes. A warrior was only as good as their last fight, so no matter how great Machiko did in the past, and how worthy she proved to be, she had to prove her worth in every battle. Having said that, Machiko did manage to secure for herself a private room inside the Predator Mothership. It was a mark of honor and skill that only the most skilled and experienced warriors held. On the other hand, the other Predators had to sleep in a room that Machiko called the Pit. Yet in the one year that Machiko spent with Top Knot's clan, she started to feel tired of the alienation she received from her adopted alien friends. She had assumed that other Predators would be as forward-thinking and tolerant towards her as the Chande was, but she was horribly mistaken. Machiko was constantly reminded that she was neither a Yaocha by birth, nor was she an equal. This often led her to question her choices. Was it the right decision to stay back at Ryushi? Was she there with them because she failed to prove true worth amongst humans? As a member of the clan, Machiko's only goal becomes learning all there is to know about the Yaocha code of life and honor. I mean, yes, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, but Romans were humans, and these creatures were half savages. Nevertheless, in one of the hunting trips, Machiko went with Top Knot and his clan to a planet infested with xenomorphs. Whether the xenos arrived there due to predators or some other unfortunate accident is mainly unknown. However, it quickly became clear that this was not a hunting mission, but a war, because Top Knot wanted to capture the xenomorph queen so that her eggs could be used to seed other planets with xenos, as was the Yaocha custom. The more experienced warriors were stationed on the front line, and the less seasoned ones were placed to guard the rear, a position that Machiko considered to be necessary, but not quite honorable. But, irrespective of where one was placed, the competition and hunger for more kills was fierce. One of the Yauchuas, named Shorty, a name that was given to him because of his height, stole Machiko's kill. It wasn't before long that Machiko got her sweet revenge when a xenomorph attacked and subdued Shorty. But Machiko didn't let the bug kill Shorty. Instead, she killed the bug and stole Shorty's chance at an honorable death. Furthermore, she humiliated him in front of his entire clan. After fighting off hordes of xenos, the clan finally made it to the queen, but the war was far from over. Wars demand the blood of soldiers. Many xenos and predators fell, including one named Three Spot. He managed to subdue the queen and restrain her, but after momentarily losing his focus, the xenomorph queen freed herself and crushed Three Spot under her feet, which brought him instant death. Machiko didn't want any more of her adopted brethren to lose their lives, so she broke formation and intervened. Although she had successfully controlled the situation, she had disobeyed a direct order from Top Knot, and such insubordination doesn't go overlooked in the clan so her bravery and quick thinking nature were rewarded with rebukes nevertheless they managed to get hold of the queen and bring her into the ship but by now her children were attacking the ship from all directions they managed to close the entrance to the ship and take the queen inside the nesting chamber exactly where they wanted her to be however machiko gets trapped inside the nesting chamber with the queen and shorty takes his revenge by closing the hatch then again machiko had had prior experience with the xeno queen and was a more skilled 
skilled and adept warrior than Shorty had imagined. Chico left the nesting chamber unscathed and also severed the queen's fingers, once again proving her mettle, and yet, they don't give her the respect she deserves. It was not before long that Machiko witnessed the arrival of the last stragglers of Top Knot's clan, and among them was the young, but prodigal warrior named Light Stepper. He had come to Top Knot to join him in the next hunt. However, Light Stepper was wearing a United States Colonial Marines flag over his severed arm. Machiko knew immediately that the flag was a trophy, a trophy that he won in a battle after slaying the colonial marine to whom the flag belonged. Although saddened to see the flag, Machiko assured herself that it must have been an honorable and just battle because that's what honor demands from a Yaucha. But Machiko couldn't control her human instincts and grabbed Light Stepper's arm to inspect further, an act that was considered an insult and insubordination. Naturally, Light Stepper punched and knocked Machiko down. He would have definitely killed her had she not made a submissive gesture. Machiko had lost her honor when she seemingly insulted Light Stepper, and so Top Knot decided that the only way she could regain her honor was through fighting a lower-ranking predator in the fighting pit. When the time for the battle came, she found herself standing against Shorty. Now, it is important to note that Machiko was just a human, and clearly not a match for the physical strength of even a dwarf Yautrua, like Shorty. Yes, she was prolific and agile, and her speed was her strength, but she was extremely vulnerable without her weapon. As the fight began, Machiko tried to use Shorty's exaggerated physical strength and rage against the half-savage, and her proficiency in martial arts helped her see the fight through, almost until the end. Just as she was about to land the final blow, one of Shorty's comrades held her leg. This gave Shorty time to rise back up and get to his senses. Although Machiko kicked the Yachua that cheated, Shorty was back on his feet again, and this time he didn't take any chances. He started to beat her left, right, and center with full Yauchua force. Machiko knew that the only way the fight was going to end was in her death or her being thrown out of the pit and into the arena. The choice wasn't very hard to make. Being alive was more important than getting an honorable death. So she allowed Shorty to kick her so hard that she dived out of the pit. Machiko had lost, but she survived. The loss didn't go unpunished and Machiko was left out when Top Knot chose comrades who would go with him on a hunting trip to the planet of Bunda. She was subsequently thrown into the food quarters where they expected her to serve food to other lower ranked predators. After this point, the comic simultaneously serves as a sequel to three comics. It brings characters like Machiko Noguchi from the original Alien vs Predator series, Top Knot from Alien vs Predator Blood Time, and Kat Lara, Martin Jess, and Brian Ellis from Aliens Frenzy. We've already spoken about how Top Knot found Machiko, but not quite about Kat Lara, Martin Jess, and Brian Ellis. Well, the three of them were once a part of a hunter-killer squad known as the Max Team. They were highly modern and well-equipped cell swords, if you will, and the most advanced weapon in their arsenal was an exosuit called Max. After one of their missions on a space station called the DS Service Terminal 949 goes south, only Laura, Jess, and Ellis manage to escape in their ship Nemesis. Unfortunately, their fuel finishes mid-space and they start drifting into the depths of space. As a last and rather hopeless attempt, they send out radio transmissions from the Nemesis to anyone who could be listening. This transmission finally gets picked up by a floating platform, Big Archie, placed over the jungles of planet Bunda. Furthermore, Machiko had brought with her a leap weave receptor from Ryushi, her only link with humanity. Mostly, she didn't hear anything remotely human on this transmitter. She did hear the conversation between Nemesis and Big Archie. And not long after the Yawichas had left for their hunt on Bunda, she heard through the same transmitter that Top Knot and his clan were brutally killing humans on Bunda. Machiko knew right then and there where her true allegiances lay. She was tired of trying to fit in among creatures who would never accept her or treat her as an equal. It was time for Machiko to make some choices, some quick and drastic decisions. Naturally, she betrays her adoptive, half-savage brethren and goes on a rampage, killing several of the Yauchas still present with her because 
That was the only way she could escape. Furthermore, she frees the Xenomorph Queen that she had helped capture earlier. Machiko then takes control of the shuttle and crashes it on Bunda before meeting Ellis, Laura, and Jess from Nemesis. However, Machiko's union with humans for the first time in more than three years was short-lived because they soon got sandwiched between Top Knot's clan and swarms of Xenomorphs led by their queen. Now, the interesting thing about the Xenos from this story is that they were birthed from gorilla-like species native to planet Bunda. So the resultant bugs had the combined physical strength and dominance of gorillas and Xenos. How does someone fight such beings? Well, by using the Max Exosuit. Ellis was quick enough to save the group from the Xenos, but the group of humans soon gets attacked by a bunch of Yowches, including Shorty. Machika was now well equipped and more determined than ever to exact her revenge on Shorty. Shorty had attacked Machika with Freckles, and the battle was going to be intense. Machiko impaled Freckles using her wrist blades and finished him by gunning him down. This left Machiko and Shorty to indulge in a death match. It became quite evident that the survivor would not only walk away with their life, but also their honor. Although Shorty tried to put up a good fight, Machiko was now in her best form, enraged because of the earlier cheating and killing of humans. She was going to leave no stone unturned to get what she desired, and all that she wanted now was Shorty's life. She bisected the left arm of the dwarf half-savage using her wrist blades. At this point, Machiko had rewritten Shorty's name as a bully in the times to come, and Shorty retorted by calling Machiko a human, signaling that she was not worthy of being a Yaucha. Machiko wished to prove him both right and wrong. She knew that it would be wrong as a Yawacha to slay an injured and unarmed opponent, but her human side knew that it was the smartest thing to do. If not, her mercy would later come back and bite her. So Machiko struck her wrist blades deep into his chest, finally ending the prolonged mess that was Shorty. After the fight, it was revealed that a Wayland yutani official named Mr. Briggs had been face-hugged, so Jess put him in the Max Exo suit. Briggs continued to slay other Xenos and Predators in the most gruesome of fashion, but Machiko knew that Top Knot had enough experience and skill to take down Briggs in the Max Exo suit. Naturally, she suggested that they all leave the planet of Bunda before it was too late. Machiko was finally with humans, people whom she could relate to, and people whom she could understand, people with whom she wouldn't have to struggle to fit in. What goes around comes around. Machiko had spent enough time with the Predators, and although she disliked the idea of being alienated in all instances, she did enjoy the thrill of hunting. After leaving the clan and coming home with humans to live alongside them, she started to live in a quiet place on Bellatrix 2, a planet that was placed on the left shoulder of the constellation Orion. However, astronomically speaking, Bellatrix is the third brightest star of the constellation and exists around 250 light years away from the Earth. Nevertheless, Machiko was struggling with her new lifestyle that included work and the boredom that came from it. Like a vampire tastes blood for the first time, it becomes its slave forever. The corporate lady had tasted blood and submitted to it. But her self-made miseries came to an end when an uber-rich man called Livermore Evanston came to her and offered her to serve as a guide in his privately owned hunting planet. She would escort other hunters who came to seek some thrill on the planet. Meanwhile, a long forgotten and ancient clan of predators had gone rogue. They had now resorted to killing innocent humans in their quest to gain universal dominance. And their latest target was a mining colony in the far reaches of the galaxy. The United States Colonial Marine Corps was desperate to see an end to this menace, and they knew just the right person to carry out the deed for them, Machiko Noguchi, a woman who didn't just hold certain expertise in fighting xenomorphs, but also spent quite some time fending for herself while living with the predators. Colonel Rost came to speak to Machiko to try and enlist her in the fight against these evil predators. Colonel Rost initially wanted her to negotiate with these predators. She originally refused the offer, probably because she was done with anything remotely tangled with predators, but her interest peaked to unimaginable levels when she was shown the video footage of the carnage that the predators left behind. They weren't just using typical Yaucha weaponry to slay innocent men, women, and children, but also had a brood of Xenos that they had weaponized and controlled in the most maleficent ways. Machiko remembered the stories she had heard during her time in Top Knot's clan, and she was quick to recall the predator clan called Killers. These were predators who hunted and slaughtered for fun 
and not honor, but then she was told that the killers had been wiped out entirely. However, the video clippings told her otherwise. It is important to note here that killers were basically rogue predators or predators who do not follow the Yaucha code of honor. Such predators were considered an abomination only next to pred aliens, and the Yaucha community would go to great lengths to fight off such beings because they brought a bad name to the community as a whole. Machiko agreed to join Rost in his quest. She knew well that the Colonial would need some serious assistance if they hoped to defeat this rogue clan. Naturally, she needed allies, allies who were as strong, disciplined, and as brutal as the rogues. Any guesses? Well, Machiko took the Colonial Marine's ship, Tarara, and flew to Ryushi in the hopes of meeting with her former brethren, Top Knot, and his clan. Before leaving for Ryushi to forge an alliance with Top Knot, Machiko warned the Colonial Marines that if the talks went successful and Top Knot decided to help, the humans should not try to antagonize or alienate the predators because that would be the beginning of the end for everyone. Furthermore, she had a strong feeling that Colonel Rost was a synthetic because he showed absolutely no signs of fear or aggression. Upon reaching close to Ryushi, Machiko, Ellis, and a few colonial marines took a dropship to land on the desert planet. Machiko finds the predators, and as a display of dominance, she subdues and kills one of the predators, after which she is taken to the predator holding. It turns out that the predators on Ryushi didn't have the faintest idea about her portrayal on Bunda, and she assumed that all the predators on Bunda had died. The colonial marines and Machiko helped the predators capture a xenomorph queen which proved their allegiance to the common cause, and they all leave for Koparis 7, the planet which was considered to be the base of operations of the rogue clan. Upon landing on Koparis 7, the combined force of the human predator, the Yauchuas, and the marines take down several xenomorphs that the rogue clan controlled. This forced them to retreat to safety and out of the planet. Although the rogue clan managed to fly away in their mothership, the colonial marines planted a tracking device on their ship. Machiko was once again torn between her human and predator identities. Her loyalty to Broken Tusk and value for human camaraderie held equal levels of importance to her. Tracking the device that was placed on the killer clan's mothership, Machiko and the others reached an undisclosed planet far away from Kapara 7. Here, a synthetic named Serata realizes that the rogue clan has hordes of ovomorphs and xenomorphs, but there was no xenomorph queen in near sight. He concluded that if a queen was unleashed amidst these xenomorphs, she would take control of them and they would attack the rogue killer clan. The plan worked like a piece of cake and the most potent weapon of the rogues had just turned against them. In the end, Machiko joined the new leader of Top Knot's clan who is still fighting the remaining rogues. Ellis arrives on a dropship to rescue her, but the leader stops her, douses Machiko's sword in acidic blood, and removes the insignia that Broken Tusk had marked on her forehead, finally relieving her from the duties and position of a predator. She could have stopped him or fought him, but she chose to accept her human life, which she had so easily taken for granted and discarded. And moreover, it was wiser to live as a human than die as a predator. She finally left with Ellis, and lived her life as a human. At a later point in life, she learned about another planet where the rogue clan was still in operation, but this time, she didn't care about it. Machiko had learned her lesson the hard way, and she was sure not to participate in any further skirmishes between predators, irrespective of whether they were honorable or dishonorable. So, that was the story of Machiko Noguchi, the woman who started as just another sweet little child, but went on to achieve a great many things. She fought against predators, with predators, slew innumerable Xenos, and helped save the future of the galaxy, at least once. What describes her best is the quote by Aristotle that says, You will never do anything in this world without courage. It is the greatest quality of the mind, next to honor. We personally believe that the life of Michiko Noguchi the first human to be blooded by the predators is worthy of being turned into a live action film. Let us know in the comments what you thought of this great character. Do come back later for more amazing videos. Till then, let's try to live by simple codes of honor and glory, shall we? And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.